Hey guys, this is Julio with Aircon Academy. I was doing a class and we were talking about uh, metering devices. So I just thought I would share this with you. Uh, this metering device, for example, this is your TXV, thermostatic expansion valve. Now what this valve is gonna do is gonna create a pressure drop right there. It creates a pressure drop. Everything on this side is gonna be high pressure. On that side, it's gonna be low pressure. We're gonna connect this to the liquid line. So we have the liquid line that comes in here and this is going to be connected over to the evaporator. Of course, we have this line that we connect right here. And like I said, this is going to be my liquid line. And you can see that this is threaded. So this is very easy to hook up to a system because this is threaded and that happens to be threaded. Now, when we connect this to a system, it's no big deal because like I said, you just connect the liquid line, connect it over to the evaporator, and we're set to go. This top piece up here, that's going to be what they call my power head. This is my power head. On this one, we see that it has the different colors up on top. That, of course, is going to tell me what type of refrigerants this, well, I can use this TXV on. So, for example, this is 4502, 404A, 402A, and 507. So now, this is my, those are the refrigerants in my power head up here. Now, the power head is, you can see that it has this attachment here. It has the uh, sensing of the transmission tube and it has the sensing bulb. The sensing bulb, of course, needs to be attached to the suction line. It's gonna be attached to the suction line, but we have to keep a couple of things in mind. One is that if we have a suction line that happens to be, let's say, three quarters of an inch, then it's going the sensing bulb is going to have to be up on top. We're going to want it up here on top. Rule of thumb says that if the line is smaller than seven eighths, smaller than seven eighths, then it needs to be on top. If the suction line, if it happens to be greater than seven eighths, let's say for example, one, in a quarter inch, then it's going to be 45 degrees from the bottom. Okay, so now we look at this, we see that that's about 45, that's 45. So we can either place it here or we can place it here. The reason we do that is because traveling with the refrigerant, we might have some oil. So we don't want it down here because then it's gonna be sensing the temperature of the oil. We don't wanna do that. Also, we don't want it up on top either. And the reason for that is because they say that it's for stratification. It's because of stratification. What is stratification? Stratification is when you have layers of gases or layers of liquids, layers of fluids. So they're saying the temperature here is gonna be different than the temperature up here. We all know that hot air rises. So in other words, they're saying that the temperature of the gas up here might be warmer than down here at the bottom. So we don't want it at the bottom because of the oil. We do want to see if there is liquid refrigerant traveling through there, and that's why we place it at 45 degrees from the bottom, either on this side or on that side. Don't forget, when we install one of these, we have to get it on there, make sure that we have a good connection. In other words, if this is my sensing bulb and this is my, my suction line, you've got to have a good connection. You can't be crooked on there. You can't have it so that it's not touching like this. Okay, there's a ga air gap in there, but we have to have a good connection. Also, don't forget, when we have this, when we have a system like this and we have our suction line that is horizontal like this, then we're gonna want it like this, and we need to put straps on it. We need to have a strap down here and here. Don't forget, I just make this major drawing real fast, but you want a real good connection between the suction line and the sensing bulb. You can have your capillary tube like that. Typically, you know, we have these copper straps that come with it. Well, we want to make sure that we use the copper straps because if we 
use, let's say, tape. I've seen guys use electrical tape. They tape it on there. What happens to the electrical tape because of the heating, the cooling, and the moisture that might be in here? It's going to unravel. It's going to come off. Next thing you know, that sensing bulb is just kind of hanging there like this. Okay, so we can't do that. We can't. We don't want to use tape on there. Some guys say, well, I'll just use the uh, zip ties because it's so much easier. Well, you're right. You put zip ties on here, tie it down there, tie it over here, and no problem. The problem is that plastic, zip ties are made out of plastic. How long is that going to last? I have seen zip ties that when you touch them, they snap. Copper, how long is your copper going to last? It's going to last a very, very long time. Now, this is a discussion that we have in class a lot of times. You know, how long should your air conditioning unit last? Well, if your system is installed properly, and that's a big deal right there, installing it properly. If you have pulled a good vacuum, you have your suction and your liquid line filter dryer. Some manufacturers, they give you a liquid line filter dryer nowadays so you can put it in there. But if you put that in there and you put a suction line filter dryer in there, you know your system is going to be clean. It's going to trap all of the, all of the dirt and is going to trap the moisture. If you do the maintenance, you clean your coils, you know you have good superheat, you know that a system is tight because you pulled down to 500 microns and it held, you know your system is tight. So when you do, have done all of these things, that unit, how long should it last? You're looking at 20, 30 years. You should not be replacing units every five to 10 years. No, that's just crazy. I have installed units, you know, back in 1987, I remember installing units and they're still working. How do I know that they're still working? Well, because one of these units I'm talking about, I put in my parents' house. And both my parents are gone. But regardless, I know the house and my brother actually lives there and the unit's still working. And I put that unit in there back in 1987. We're looking at 2021 now. So you do the math, that unit is still working and it still works perfectly, no problem. Still uses R22 like we did back then. Point is, you install it properly, you take some of these measures right here and the unit will work like it's supposed to and it will last a very long time. So now, other than the copper straps, what should you do with this? You should have insulation on it. All of this should be insulated because this is supposed to be sensing the temperature of the refrigerant traveling through the suction line, not the temperature of the air. You put zip ties on here and you just put the insulation on there and you forget about it. The zip ties are gonna break. The insulation will probably come off. And next thing you know, you have that sensing bulb just dangling right there. What happens when it dangles? It's gonna sense a warmer temperature than the suction line. When that happens, then you're going to flood the evaporator because this sensing bulb is going to say, hey, it's warmer than it's supposed to be. So what's going to happen? It's going to open up the uh, valve. Once it opens up the valve, then you flood the evaporator. You flood that evaporator, liquid gets back to the compressor, kills your compressor. And I have seen it where guys just change the compressor don't find out what caused it to go bad and what happens a few weeks later or a month later or two months later, they replace that compressor again. So you need to make sure that that valve, that sensing bulb is making good contact. It is strapped on there very well and it is insulated. Again, use the copper straps that come with it. So now we have the sensing bulb that we talked about, the power head, <clears throat> Right here, we have the power head. So this power head, it can come off of there. Once we take this off, inside we can see the diaphragm that's in there. When this senses temperature, the diaphragm is going to expand down and it's going to push down. Once it pushes down, what it's going to do, it's going to take these pins that are here. It's going to take those pins and it's going to push them down. So you have these two pins, one and, well, let's take this off, and two right there. Two pins. These pins 
what they're going to do is they're going to be pushed down by the diaphragm. And those pins are going to be pushing down on the needle right here. You have two pins, one here and one here. They push down on this. When they push down on this, it moves this down. Once it moves it down, it moves that needle that you see right there. It moves it off of that center hole. That center hole, that's where the pressure drop develops. We know that a metering device creates a pressure drop. Liquid comes in here, let's say, let's say it's R22, 260 pounds of pressure. Comes out this way, let's say 68 pounds, because 68 gives us 40 degree evaporator. So that pressure drop happens right there. In other words, right in that little opening that you see right there. Okay. Now, once those pins push down on that, it compresses that spring. It compresses that spring right there. This spring is what they call superheat spring. So this is what they call my superheat spring right there, and it fits right on up in there. Now, at the bottom of this, there's another little brass piece, and that brass piece is adjustable. It's adjustable by this right here. Now, you see how that is. I hope you guys can see this well enough. This is square. It is a square shape. Because it is a square shape, how are you supposed to open and close this? No, not with channel locks. I've had guys in class just jokingly say, oh, channel locks. Other guys say, well, I use my, uh, my uh, pipe wrench on it. Other guys, they say, well, I use my vice grips on it. No, you're supposed to use a service wrench on it. And most of the time, the guys are just kidding. They're joking around because we like to have fun in class. So you put your service wrench on there and you adjust it. Your spring goes on there. Your needle goes right there like this. You see that's very, very pointy, very, very sharp. That is what's, cre this is what's creating your pressure drop. And that pressure drop happens when the refrigerant goes through that center hole right there. If you notice, you have the center hole and you also have the holes for the pins. The pins go in there and then you have another hole that hole is for your internal equalizing line. I'll talk about that another time, maybe. But here, that goes screwed on there. The pins, we said the pins go in here, just like that. And then the other pin goes in there like that. The power head. screws right in there like this. There we go. So now we're set to go. Well, sort of. These are not tight. In real life, they need to be very, very tight because you're going to have metal to metal contact. And we want to make sure that we do not have leaks. If these were not threaded, if this was sweat, in other words, you're going to use your torch and you get some sulfos, your oxyacetylene rig, or some of you like the... Um, turbo torch, whichever, you can, you know, you're going to have to heat this up so you can melt the sulfos. To do that, well, guess what? You're going to have to take this apart. You're going to have to pull this piece off, remove that, set it over to the side, take the power head off, set it over to the side. The only thing that's going to be left inside is going to be just your seat. And that seat is made out of brass that is screwed into the brass body. So that's not going to get hurt. That's not going to hurt anything. You heat it up, you let it cool down very well, and then you can put everything back in. Why do you want to take it apart? Because in here, we're going to have some kind of gas or some kind of liquid. Typically, it's the same type of refrigerant that you have in the system. So if this is a 410A system, you may have a couple of drops of 410A in here. You overheat this. The temperature goes up too much, you're going to pop the diaphragm, you're going to break the power head, so now your power head is not going to be any good. You don't take this apart. In here, you have a seal of some kind. Sometimes they use Teflon, sometimes they use just rubber to make sure that the pressure does not leak out this way. So now what happens is you leave this in there, you're going to melt all of that. So you need to take this off, you need to remove it, set it aside, take the pins out, 
and then you can install your TXV in place. Now, this is just a short overview of your TXV. The other thing on TXVs is that when we look at the, at the body, of course, I'm not sure if you can see it here, but that right there says Sporlin on it. Now, that is just a brand name. That's who makes this, this valve. Sporlin makes this valve. If we look on the other side, right here, and this is a little more difficult to see, but right there, right where my finger's pointing, it says one quarter. What does that mean? Well, that's the tonnage. That typically, this number that you see stamped on the valve body, that's the tonnage of that valve. So this is a quarter ton, and you can use it on these type of refrigerants. Again, on this one here, I didn't really go into it too much, but you have your power head. Your power head is going to put, you create pressure up here because of the sensing bulb, is gonna put pressure here, pushing down on the pins. Those pins come down, it's gonna open up the valve, allow the refrigerant to go from high pressure to low pressure, creating that pressure drop right there. Now, I'm gonna make another video later on, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but there's a lot to metering devices. There's a lot to TXVs. And, um, you know, I just hope that this video helped you a little bit. Again, this is uh, Julia with Aircon Academy, and I'll see you next time, and be safe out there.